to order on August 15th, 2023. City Clerk, roll call, please. Mayor Schlachter. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Ryden. Here. Council Member Grove. Here. Council Member Milliman. Here. Council Member Valdez. Present. Council Members Barr and Driscoll are absent. We do have a quorum. Thank you. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Next up on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Council, everyone's had a chance to review the agenda. Any changes? Seeing no changes, the agenda is approved without objection. Uh, item four, comments and reports. I'm gonna turn it over to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of the council. Just two things tonight. I wanna uh, mention to the council and the public that um, our, our contractors on the Jackass Hill culvert collapse, also known as sinkhole, um, have been hard at, at work, and we know the, uh, the, 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 some of the, the challenges that that's caused. The school's gotten underway. But we're pleased to hear um, so far this week from the contractors that they're planning to be uh, completely finished uh, by the middle of next week. So um, that will be, that'll be good news. I uh, also want to just mention the energy that we had this past weekend for the, uh, oh, the Little Jam concert on Friday night. Uh, it was our largest yet, about 2,000 people we, we, uh, we estimate were there. And we have the final one coming up on September 16th, and we hope that even more people can get there. So that's all I have tonight, Mayor. Great, thank you. City Attorney, any report? Uh, no, I believe you'll touch on it, but obviously LPS is uh, back in session starting today. And just a reminder to the motorists out there uh, in the morning uh, to be extra careful. That's it. Right. Thank you. Councilmember Milliman? Uh, not much of a report other than I wanted to extend the big uh, um, gratitude thanks to our Public Works Department for the new raised uh, crosswalks in downtown. Um, I've seen a couple of cars have to really slow down as uh, pedestrians are crossing those walks. I'm very appreciative of that, so thank you. Councilman Valdez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to just thank all the volunteers and city staff that worked the, uh, the, the cr criterium last week. I think it was a wonderful event. Uh, uh, many of the volunteers have been there doing that for years. Many of the volunteers are also working the Western Welcome Week coming up. also like to thank Romanos for providing food for all the the riders the night before the race. Uh, Romanos is one of the sponsors, but uh, uh, definitely a big shout out to uh, McDonald's Audi. That, that's, I believe it's their 10th year of sponsoring, uh, being the major sponsor for the Criterium. And it just shows uh, uh, McDonald's Audi and many of the other uh, businesses that, that I haven't mentioned uh, that are, are part of Littleton and they contribute in many, many ways. But uh, again, thank you to McDonald's, Audis, and Romanos. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Grove. Uh, to follow up what uh, Council Member Valdez was talking about, uh, the Twilight Criterium was a wonderful event. People come out and line uh, the uh, streets and watch the cyclists. It goes from three until 10 at night. It's a very fun event. So those that are listening and those from uh, that are here in Littleton, if you have a chance to go next year, I highly encourage it. And thank you to uh, Kelly Nardi and her team who worked tirelessly all day and all evening um, to get that all set up. And it, it was a wonderful, wonderful event. Uh, second thing I wanted to talk about uh, is last Thursday, we had our delegation from our biggest sister city in Australia. And we had a wonderful uh, reception. Uh, the city had a band there for us. The Bega group uh, had lunch. We had a few speeches, and we got to see our old friends from Bega. And then they were taken off by their host family. So it was quite fun. And for those that don't know it, um, this uh, relationship goes back 61 years when Houston Waring and Curly Annabelle got together and thought that we should be sister cities. And we've been doing this for um, all that time, going back and forth between Bega and Australia, uh, from Bega, Australia to Littleton. And so it's just wonderful. Some people have been here before and some people haven't. We've had a host of activities. Um, they will 
be here for 10 days, stay with two different host families, and we've had some wonderful um, activities. Uh, we started off on Saturday night with a barbecue fundraiser and a square dancing. It's really fun. Sunday night, we had a history tour, and then we had a reception at Town Hall, and we got to see a table reading of the next uh, play, which is All Shook Up, if I've got that correct. Uh, we went, yesterday we went on a scavenger hunt, I went to a Rockies game, and then tonight we're going to hear from the student ambassador who won the trip uh, from, to be able to come here to Australia. We have a student ambassador, and when, we took a student ambassador with us when we went to uh, Biga last fall. Uh, there's many more events this week culminating in, accumulating in uh, the parade on Friday, on Saturday. So uh, just a reminder to those who are watching uh, to come to the parade. It's always just so much fun and there's a lot of vendors and I um, <coughs> highly encourage you to do that. And then they will be taking off in most cases on Sunday. So it's been a wonderful week to get reacquainted and um, to enjoy their company. And there's a lot of other fun events. Look on the Western Welcome website and you can see all the things that are happening between now and the end of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, thank you. Welcome everyone in the blue shirts. Welcome Vega. It's really good to see all of you here. I hope uh, the United States is treating you well. Um, I had the opportunity to observe our police department's dispatch, 911 dispatch on Friday night for just a little less than three hours. Yeah, and you know what, I just want to spend a, send a special thanks to the folks who are working there and the police department for letting me do that. I learned a lot about how calls are triaged and, and staffed, and we didn't go more than three minutes um, between calls, and so that was really helpful for me to understand systems. So thank you for, for the work we do, um, or for the work that our um, dispatchers do. Very grateful for that. Uh, we're gonna hear an update later today from uh, Mike with the um, Tri-Cities Homelessness Policy Work Group. Um, but just one additional thing that he's not going to go over tonight is we're working on a landlord engagement, which is really working on the prevention side of homelessness. So maybe we'll see more on that, but I'm really excited about, about that program. It's already been budgeted for, and again, we're really addressing um, ways to support people who are at risk for homelessness. And I think that's not something the group has really done yet, so I'm excited for us to, to dig deeper into that. Um, and then I am our liaison to the opioid, Region 9 Opioid Governance Committee, deciding on all that money. We're going to have a study session in the next couple weeks um, that will highlight kind of what the county has done, the region has done, and where what funds they've allocated. Um, and I'll have more to add on that, but the group has allocated um, over $2 million um, for programming over the next two years um, in the buckets that we talked about a few weeks ago. And that is it for now. All right, thank you. Uh, first, let me just welcome everyone from Biga visiting here. It's uh, great to have you. And it, this room, for anyone that had been here last time or seen pictures, has changed since uh, the last time we were in here. It used to be a, a kind of a, a darkened, round kind of pit, but now it's nice and bright and there's lots of light here. Um, so but good for all of us to see you and welcome you here to Littleton. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers the last time here coincided with what today is called and why we all went outside before is called City Hall Selfie Day. Um, it's a uh, kind of a, a public awareness campaign about public service and local government. And so I'm going to take a quick selfie with all of you in the background here and then I'll post it on social media later. But just that's why I'm going to stand up here. Something like that, close enough. <laughs> um, I also want to echo uh, comments from Councilmember Grove with all the Western Welcome Week activities going on uh, this week. It's a great uh, organization and lots of fun activities culminating with the parade uh, this Saturday, so I hope to see lots of people out there. I had to miss it last year, so I'm eager to get back out there in the parade route. Um, to echo what the city attorney said, as people may know, today was the first day of school for Littleton Public Schools, so there's going to be lots of little kids running around crossing streets. Uh, they may not always look both ways before uh, they run into the streets, so please, everyone uh, who is out there on the roads, just take extra special caution, uh, drive around the school zones, and, and keep an eye out for uh, little ones, or and big ones, too. The, the, the big kids also don't necessarily keep an eye out where they're going, either. So. Just everyone drive safely, please. Um, council, just want to remind Council that we have our South Platte Renew uh, joint breakfast with Inglewood uh, this Thursday up at the uh, plant. And then uh, lastly, I just want to 
uh, mention a little bit a couple of the items we have on consent are dealing with uh, IGAs with the county uh, for the elections. And I just want to say the reason that we do that, there's, there's multiple reasons that we do that. And the first of all is the cost savings, as we know that we just went through a special election where our city uh, ran it on our own and uh, it was very costly and took a lot of time and effort from the city clerk and she and her staff did an amazing job with that. Uh, so I want to thank you and I look, hope you're looking forward to having a coordinated election this time. Um, the other reason why we coordinate with the counties is because they know what they're doing and they do it well. Um, I know there's lots of talk with about our elections uh, going on and I just want to say, you know, our elections are safe, secure, and accurate and we should have confidence uh, in those elections. Uh, we have people on both sides of the aisle, partisan, uh, left, right, and independent people that analyze the elections and have noticed that they are safe secure and accurate. And so we just need to keep that in mind as we move forward into election seasoning with that, that we, we should and do have confidence in our uh, election staff. And that is all I have for my public comment. Um, <clears throat> Councilmember Millen? One more thing. Good luck to Australia tomorrow. I hope that they beat England. <laughs> <laughs> All right, item five on the agenda is scheduled appearances. We do have one scheduled appearance tonight, and so I'm going to invite up uh, is Jesse. Is he coming up first, or is someone coming up to introduce you? <laughs> Who is? <laughs> Phil McDonald is? Okay. Mayor Kyle, councillors, city council staff, members of the uh, Beagle Littleton Association group and friends. I've brought a message from the Mayor of Bega Valley Shire to you all tonight. The Bega Valley Shire has increased rates by 25% in 2023-24. We are in a dire financial situation. Please send $25 million as a gift <laughs> as soon as possible. I'm only kidding. <laughs> I'll get rid of that. The f our finance director is kind of sweating back there right now. <laughs> we can have a check ready by the end of the meeting, I think. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> we'd, we'd be quite happy with 20 million. <laughs> okay, so I'm honoured tonight to be able to read this message from the Mayor of Bega Valley Shire. Warm greetings from the Bega Valley Shire. I hope this letter finds you in the best of health and spirits. I am writing to you as we prepare for the upcoming visit of our delegation to Littleton in August 2023. It was truly a pleasure hosting the recent delegation from Littleton in our vibrant community. The visit was a testament to the enduring bond we share as twin communities since 1961. And I'm happy to report the five cut leaf birch trees gifted from Littleton are sinking healthy roots into the Bega soil. Over the years, Bega and Littleton may have taken different paths, but the strength of our twin community status remains unshakable, thanks to the down-to-earth and wonderful people who call these communities home. Among our delegation this year is Misty Annabelle, the granddaughter of Curly Annabelle, who along with House Waring were the architects of this long-running relationship between our communities. Their vision and friendship allowed us to build a bridge that has trans transcended oceans and time. Our recent histories have brought us even closer together as both of our communities have faced the daunting challenges posed by bush and wildfires. In 2009-2020, the Bega Valley Shire was struck by devastating bushfires that claimed lives, homes and vast hectares of land. It was during the same time that the communities and beautiful forests to the north and west of Littleton were also severely impacted by wildfires. In times of hardship, enduring relationships such as ours hold even greater significance as we share our experiences and come together as one community. It's with great pride that our delegation will be bringing a book compiled with experiences from the communities across Australia that were affected by the black summer bushfires. This compilation includes stories from our own shire, which we present to the people of Littleton as a beacon of hope. 
It exemplifies the strength and resilience of communities during times of adversity and serves as a reminder that recovery is possible through the unity and determination of its people. As the Mayor of Bega Valley Shire, I extend our community's best wishes to the people of Littleton and its surrounds. If any of your residents are on the path of recovery from the fires, please know that they are in our thoughts. Together we stand united and offer our support in any way we can. Reflecting on our extraordinary journey, it is wonderful to think that a 1950s documentary about house wearing and the value of a free press could blossom into such a meaningful relationship. This connection, initiated by the editors of two newspapers and later formalised by the Eisenhower government's then newly introduced People to People program, <coughs> exemplifies the true spirit of our relationship. It is not about our governments, economies, lead industries or revenue bases, but it is about the heart and soul of our people, hard-working, kind-hearted and welcoming individuals who make our communities truly special. As we eagerly anticipate the arrival of our delegation in Littleton, I wanted to convey our deepest gratitude for maintaining this wonderful relationship and for all the efforts you and your community have put into strengthening our bond over the years. I'm confident that this visit will further cement our twin community status and create new memories for generations to come. Wishing you and your community all the best and please extend my warm regards to the people of Littleton. Signed, Councillor Russell Fitzpatrick, Mayor of Beagie Valley Shire. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our student ambassador. Um, Jessie Smith won the Curly Annabelle Ambassador Award this year to come to Littleton and he has a presentation to make tonight. Jessie was selected from 25 applicants. Uh, we had great response from the local schools. There are four secondary schools within the Bega Valley Shire and they all support the Bega Littleton Sister City program very well. And um, I'm delighted now to be able to ask Jesse to come up and present to you his presentation. Thanks, Jess. Thank you very much for that, Phil. Um, so I hope everyone is having a good afternoon. So my name is Jesse Smith and I attend Bega High School. I'm 15 years of age and I'm very honoured to be up here rep representing the Bega Valley Shire and I'm, I feel very, have, I've had a very warm welcome to Littleton. So I'm here to present you my life in the Bega Valley. Sorry. My family and I discovered the Bega Valley late 2012 after we finished our travels around Australia. The unique landscapes, close access to the beach and the mountains made it an easy choice for us. The bottom left is Kalaroo, a small, a very small quaint town in between Tartha and Bega. That was the first town we moved to when we came into the Bega Valley Shire. The middle picture is the Tartha, Tartha Preschool. That was the first school that I attended in the Bega Valley. I later on moved to Tartha Primary School where I started my kindergarten to grade six ad adventure. That is where I met some of my best friends that I'm still extremely close with today. And I think I, hopefully I can stay very close with them. That picture is me climbing Mount Kosciuszko. I'm not sure if many people from America here know what Mount Kosciuszko is, but it is the highest mountain in Australia and it's only a two hour drive out of the Bega Valley, one of the many great perks. This slide is just dedicated to a little bit about myself and my family. I'd recently got a little puppy and her name is Sunday, but I'm pretty sure by the time I get back, she's not gonna be very little anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the middle slide is a photo taken from my house. Not only is the sunset great, but just behind that tree on the far left is actually Bega. There's a couple of photos of my family and I, and my friends, and me doing my favorite sport, which is mountain bike riding. The Bega Valley has so many activities and resources to offer. 
not only has it got a very wide variety of education services, but also sports and hobbies. Australian football and rugby league are very dominant sports in the Bega Valley. They're closely followed by snow sports, equestrian, and other, and other small sports such as golf and lawn bowls. The bottom left slide is what we in Australia call nippers. Now, nippers is a surf life-saving activity that is all up, up all along the coast of New South Wales and Australia. It teaches young kids how to stay safe in the ocean, as well as learn how to paddle nipple, nippers boards, which is those surfboard looking things in the picture, as well as learn how to swim confidently in the ocean. I was once a little nipper myself, but I now do life saving and water safety for the nippers. So I teach them how to become confident in the ocean, as well as push them onto some waves. <laughs> some of those kids actually have incredible bravery. I, the, amount of, the amount of kids that I push onto huge waves is just, I don't even want to go out that far. <laughs> I know a lot of friends and students that go up to the snow each weekend during the winter. That picture is from Threadbo Resort, arguably one of the best snow, sport, uh, snow resorts in Australia. And yet again, it's only a two hour drive out of the Bega Valley. Living in the Bega Valley is one of the only places in the world that allows you to have access to the beach in the morning and the snow fields in the afternoon. The Bega Valley is very agricultural driven. As some of you may know Bega cheese, I'd have to say it's arguably the best, arguably the best cheese in Australia. <laughs> and dairy farming, even if they're not making big brands, they're still carrying the community along with their acts of kindness. So this photo is Tarthra. <laughs> Tarthra is about a 15 minute drive out of Bega. I love this photo of Tarthra because not only does it show off its beauty, it encompasses the activities that are available within the town. Up the back in the bushland is where the bushland activities are such as bushwalking and hiking as well as mountain bike trails. As you move further up towards the beach, that little building on the beachfront is where the Tartha Surf Club is, where Nippers is held, life-saving. It's also a patrolled surf beach, so during the summertime it gets really busy, full of tourists swimming. As we come up to the point, Tartha Wharf is sit sitting on the point. Not only is Tartha Wharf a very big attraction for the people along the coast, as it has access to deep water, allowing them to catch big fish, it's also a historical piece in the valley. It is one of, I believe it's one of three remaining open ocean timber wharfs left in Australia. Very nice photo of Darthur. The, the strength of the people and the community is renowned across Australia. What stands out for me in the community is when, is what Phil touched on during the 2019, 2020 bushfires that hit the Bega Valley severely. An act of kindness that the Bega Valley shown was providing a relief shelter for families that were in need. The community donated clothes, food and other necessities to see families <coughs> by that may have no longer had a house to go back to. But as well as supporting families in need, they've also supported athletes the top left is Kai Otten. Now, I'm not sure many people may be aware of him because he is a pro surfer. <laughs> but he is a very famous surfer. He surfed on the world tour for multiple years and did very well. He's actually living in the Bega Valley at the moment. He's one of my idols because not only does he grow up, has he grown up surfing the same waves that I do, but I've actually spent a lot of time with his child because um, his kid does nippers. So he's one of the brave ones, as you can imagine. Kezi Apps is a very inspirational female rugby league player. She's inspired a lot, of women, uh, a lot of women and young girls that I know to strive for their dreams and try and make it big in the rugby league world. She's came to our school, my school a lot of times and I believe a lot of other schools around the coast. She's a very inspirational person and a very well-known person around the valley as well. 
that book up there, When the Fire Met the Sea, I was lucky enough to be a part of it while attending Tartha Primary School. The book includes poems, illustrations, and stories of student experiences during the devastating fires. It was published whilst I was still at the school, and it was a great experience to be a part of. This is a devastating photo of how close the fires got to Tarthra. As you can see, it just grazed the edge of the town. Thankfully, it didn't wipe out too much of the town itself. The Big Valley has a very rich Aboriginal history. The top left picture is a photo of Mumbler Falls, which is a sacred site to the Yuan people of the valley. A couple people from Bega may recognise those faces down there. But that photo was taken after the fires, as the fires burnt and destroyed a lot of Aboriginal land, as well as bushland activities. The Bega Valley's coastline is known as the Sapphire Coast due to its turquoise coloured oceans and beauty. Not only is the coast a major attraction, but maybe what's in it. Whale watching is a huge phenomenon in the coast. Especially during the months of August, oh. especially during a certain time of the year when the Southern Ocean whale migration is on. The whales journey 5,000 kilometres from Antarctica to the warmer waters of Queensland, Australia to breed. Parts of the Bega Valley is known for devastating whaling history. This contributed to the near extinction of whales during the 1950s. The humpback whale population was estimated to be below 500 in the entirety of the world during that time of whaling. Thankfully, whaling in Australia is banned, but unfortunately, it is still active in some countries. <coughs> but there is now estimated to be roughly 1.5 million whales of all species this year, and it is said to be an amazing whale watching season. So too bad I'm in the middle of America. <laughs> During my 10 years in the valley, I've definitely noticed the population of all animals and people thriving. I can see why it's such a big tourist attraction, because now, that after my 10 years in the valley, I've finally become conscious of how lucky I am to live in such a great area. But thank you very much for watching my presentation. I hope that some of you have learnt something about the Bega Valley, but if you haven't, feel free to ask me some questions about it. But I may be able to answer a question for you right now. I'm the one on, in the right. <laughs> Council, I don't have any questions, but he went and sat back down. Any questions? <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Thank you. Well, well done. We learned a lot about that. It was a great presentation. Thank you. All right, next item up on our agenda is proclamations. We do not have any proclamations tonight. Item seven is public comment. Uh, if you wish to address City Council under public comment, please sign in on the public speaker form uh, before the meeting. Public comment is an opportunity to express opinions regarding issues that are not part of tonight's public hearings on tonight's agenda. A uh, separate opportunity will be provided for comment on any public hearing. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. Uh, we expect comments to be civil, disrespe disrespectful, and disruptive behavior will not be tolerated. City Council is not authorized uh, under open meeting laws to discuss, comment, or take action at this meeting on any issue raised by public comment that is not part of tonight's meeting. I may refer matters to the city manager and or city attorney for immediate comment after public comment, or to staff to attain additional information and report back to council as appropriate. Uh, when you have, I'll call the people up on the list up here. If you can please introduce yourself and state your uh, name and address or district, uh, and you'll have three minutes, and I will notify you uh, when you get close to the three minutes and let you know that you, or when you hit three minutes, let you know your time is up. Uh, we have four people. Uh, signed up tonight, and I would just like to note the amazingness with the quietness that that whole group got up. I was reading it, and I didn't even knew you were doing that. <laughs> they were quiet. All right. 
First up is uh, Ben Traquir. You can correct me. It's a uh, truck where, like truck and the question where. Uh, tough to follow that presentation. Um, my name is uh, Ben Traquare, uh, and I live at 8417 South Reed Street. Um, and I am one of the co-founders of a group called uh, Littleton Social Cycle, which is a group that leads uh, casual social bike rides uh, through Littleton a few times a month. Um, and on uh, behalf of myself and the group, I wanted to express um, uh, gratitude and support for the um, existing and planned pedestrian and bike improvements in Littleton. So um, uh, the, the race crossings um, are fantastic. Love to see those and love to see more of them. Um, and also very happy to see the planned improvements for uh, Jackass Hill. I'm happy to see uh, bike lanes, buffered bike lanes, and plans for protected bike lanes. Um, I'm happy to see the, the city building uh, buffered bike lanes with plans to do protected, even if they're not ready to build the protected now. I'm, I'm glad we're not waiting for, for perfect um, to get in the way of good. Um, and very happy to see uh, protected crossings, um, narrowing of streets. Uh, these are all great things that I'm very happy to see and I would love to see more of um, in our city. I think that's exactly what we should be doing. Um, and so kudos, thank you, thank you, um, and uh, that's all. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I'll give a shout out to Littleton Social Cycle there. I've done that bike ride a few times, and it's a great, great event. To, and I yeah. urge everyone else to join you. On yeah. We'll be riding on uh, uh, Thursday. Wear your cowboy hats. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next up is, I can't read the last name. I'm going to say Rick. Is Rick here. My name is Rick Stuchel. I actually live just outside the city limits. Um, and first I'll say, you'll understand in a minute, but I'm going to say timing is everything. Because I uh, thought that the uh, folks from Bega were going to be here when I got to speak, and they're not. Um, so, so I've been to Australia three times, 1993, 2000, and in 2019, we actually stopped in Bega. We um, stopped to say hello. And you know, it's, it's really my favorite country. They're just great people. And the reason I want to talk tonight is that, as far as I can tell, all the events that have been scheduled are what I'm going to call private events, that there's no event here where the public's invited while, while these folks from Biga are visiting us. Um, and you know, I looked online, and it looks like the city of Littleton has about 45,000 people. And I'm going to just estimate that probably 90% of the people that live here will probably never get to Beagle or Australia for whatever reason. You know, there's elderly people who don't have the resources. Um, there's families with limited resources. And there are kids. You know, and meeting somebody from Beagle might change your life forever. Um, it will likely be the first time they've met a person from Australia. Um, and my daughter, uh, who's an adult now, had a pen pal in Melbourne when she was 12. And when she was 15, she got to spend a month with her pen pal's family in uh, Melbourne. And I'm sure it made a positive impact on her and maybe changed her life. So if, if we don't do a public event this week, then it'll be at least five years before we have the opportunity to do one while they're here again. Um, and I'm willing to help organize this. I don't know what I would do, but I can try. And uh, obviously they've, they've left the room, but I, I want to wish our friends from being a, a great trip in the United States and a safe trip home. So thanks. Thank you for those comments and uh, excellent point. And I'm sure Councilmember Grove or someone else will reach out to the Sister Exchange group and let them know, you know, more public events would be welcome. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Next up is uh, Karen Talentire. I also would like to say welcome to the Australians, but I can't. I worked as a remote worker for an Australian company a few years ago, and we had a great fun talking about who actually spoke English. So a couple weeks ago, I helped with ballot counting at a meeting of the state GOP Central Committee. The process used was a literally and figuratively transparent glass box hand-counted paper ballot process. 
and I want to tell you how well the system worked. With its double quadruple check for c collecting, counting, and totaling ballots. You will never lose sight of your ballots today, was the announcement as the voting began. To collect ballots, a three-person team held the see-through ballot box, tallied each ballot going in, and marked the voter's ID tag as having voted. With about 360 ballots, the six teams only had an average of 60 ballots each, so it didn't take long. And this is in the range of about how many might vote in a precinct. When voting closed, the teams carried the ballot boxes on stage in full sight of the assembly. On stage, each team sat at a table. The middle person read and showed each ballot to the right and left team members tallying the ballots. The right and left counting sheets had to agree with each other as well as match the number of ballots recorded in the ballot box. Counting went quickly, even though they did have to deal with fractions because several Colorado counties divide votes between two or three people. Then the counting sheets went to the totaling teams. These teams totaled the counts and fractions from all six counting teams. This was the only stage electronic devices were used. Calculators for those who aren't good at adding two thirds plus three halves plus 59 under pressure. But the calculator answers were checked against each other and the process could use abacuses just as well. Each team checked their totals with each other and then with the other team for a quadruple cross check. Results for the first vote were delayed because there were more ballots than the number of voters present according to the credentialing committee. Since the ballot totals had been double-checked, cross-checked, and spoiled ballots accounted for, the number of ballots was the reliable number. So credentials had to be rechecked. A step was added to ballot collection for the second vote. Each person got rechecked against the list of members before voting. Credentialing always takes a while, but the voting and counting went quickly with the teams now confident in the process. This time, to, this time the totals matched. So, the hand count process highlighted an existing inaccuracy and then became part of the process to fix it in real time. The two votes resulted in a clear, transparent, and decisive win for Hope Shepelman as vice chair. After watching the process openly performed before all, some were happy, some were sad, but those present agreed this leader's election was fair and seemed to be fair. The cost for this peace of mind? A ream or two of paper, the printing, pens, and plexiglass boxes. <laughs> I could have paid for it. I don't have any money. Thank you, Ms. Talentar. You're at your time. Okay, thank you. Next up, Pam Chadbourne. Good evening, council members. I'm Pam Chadbourne. I live a block and a half from here, so a couple of things. Uh, I've made this comment on occasion before, and I'm just going to say tonight's agenda is very ambitious, and I think um, too many items with impacts on the city um, and a huge number of details. Um, I appreciate the contents of the packet, which is 714 pages long, and I'm going to suggest that for most citizens that's overwhelming, and it really, there are some, there's a lot of details, and for most citizens without background, this is a hopeless package to understand. So I made this comment, I think, two weeks ago in uh, more study sessions on specifically, I'm sure a bunch of people are very interested in intersection improvements at Broadway and Littleton Boulevard, at Broadway and Mineral, at Mineral Station, the multimodal improvements in the County Line Road shared path. Um, having a study session for their reference would be good. Uh, it's obvious that a lot of work was done on that already for many of these items in the packet. Um, acknowledge the staff's work by letting them at a study session talk about what that, what it, what the results are. And uh, so I think that would have been a good thing and I'm missing th those study sessions. Also, um, the CAFR is called ACFR this year. I'm not sure, but um, I really look forward to that. Um, but it would be great to kind of have a study session about it too. It's not, it's it's not easy for most people to grasp immediately, and so I, you know, a study session on it would have been great. Um, I do want to. Oh, and uh, so one more comment, uh, and this is next week. The study session on Geneva Village occurs, and I have concerns that I live in the neighborhood and have had no outreach. 
about the consequences to the neighborhood of the decision on Geneva Village. Um, you are elected, and I know that you understand that the fate of Geneva Village affects the neighborhood. Um, <laughs> I think that this should be publicized to the neighborhood and that you should be interested in what the neighbors say about losing the town square to new construction, front range mediocre, uh, denser, losing the open space, losing the amount of landscaping, uh, losing the historic structure, and the shared environment. There is so much potential for Geneva Village besides the historic value. Um, Re-landscaping it, we could have community gardens there for both the, t the residents and the neighbors. There's so much we could do. The neighbors deserve to know about this. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, and I will just ask city manager to have the finance director if kind of talk about the name change uh, that occurred a couple years ago and I think was publicized of, of why that was named for the, uh, the comprehensive plan or the comprehensive uh, financial report. Is there anybody else that would like to speak to council? Seeing no one, I'll see if the city manager has any response to anything. Nope. No, Mayor, I'll just, I will note that <clears throat> that change in the name of what we had called the CAFR has been challenging for staff as well. So it is an, <laughs> it is an accounting standard now, and I'm, I, <clears throat> I'm sure our auditor and for finance director can comment further if there's further question. Great, thanks. Item eight is consent agenda. Uh, consent agenda items can be adopted by a simple motion. All ordinances must be read by title prior to a vote on the motion. Any consent agenda item may be removed at the request of a council member. There's quite a few things in the consent agenda, so bear with me. Uh, a, Resolution 73-2023, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement in IGA between the Arapahoe County Clerk and Recorder and the City of Littleton regarding the conduct and administration of the November 7, 2023 coordinated mail ballot election. B, Resolution 75, 2023, authorizing an IGA between the Jefferson County Clerk and Recorder and the City of Littleton regarding the conduct and administration of the November 7th, 2023, coordinated mail ballot election. Item D, Resolution 78 of 2023, amending an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Littleton and the Colorado Department of Transportation. I missed one there, didn't I? Did I miss B, read B, or did I read C? Yeah, you missed C. I missed C, I hit it twice then. Uh, no, I, hit, I said Jefferson County. B is Resolution 74, Intergovernmental Agreement between Douglas County Clerk and Recorder and City of Littleton regarding the conduct and administration of the November 7th, 2023 coordinated mail ballot election. All right. D, Resolution 78, 2023, amending an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Littleton and the Colorado Department of Transportation for reimbursement of costs associated with the Broadway and Littleton Boulevard intersection improvements. E, Resolution 81 of 2023, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Littleton and the Colorado Department of Transportation for reimbursement costs associated with the Broadway Littleton Boulevard and Broadway and Mineral Avenue intersection improvements. F, Resolution 85 of 2023, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Littleton and the Colorado Department of Transportation for reimbursement of costs associated with the Mineral Station multimodal improvements. G, Resolution 88 of 2023, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Littleton and the Colorado Department of Transportation for reimbursement of costs associated with the County Line Road shared use path. H, ID 23-199, motion to appoint Elizabeth K. Marchetti to the South Metro Housing Options Board. I, Ordinance 16 of 2023, an ordinance on first reading submitting to the Register Electors of the City of Littleton, Colorado, ballot issue regarding a proposed additional increase of 3.5% tax on the retail sale of marijuana and marijuana products. J, Ordinance 14 of 2023, an ordinance on first reading amending Title I, Chapter 9, Section 4 of Littleton Municipal Code relating to council member compensation. And K, ID 23-195, a motion to approve the minutes of August 1st, 2023, regular meeting of city council. Is there a motion? Mayor, I move to approve consent agenda items A through K. K. And I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on consent agenda items? Seeing none, I'll open the voting. The vote is five in favor. The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next up. Item nine is general business. We have several items under general business. Uh, the first is ID 23196, 2022, 
audit report and annual comprehensive financial report presentation. Uh, so we're going to have a presentation to council. This is uh, council's auditors uh, reporting on the financial report of the city here for us to uh, see, if, make sure everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing with the city. So I'm going to turn it over to the city manager to introduce uh, the presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of the council. Uh, yes, the, the annual audit and the annual comprehensive financial report are requirements of our charter and of state law. Um, and while, as the mayor said, staff does, does uh, participate heavily in especially compiling the financial statements, it is your audit and your hiring of the auditor. Um, and to that point, the, uh, our auditor representing uh, Clifton, Allen, Clifton Larson Allen, Paul Paul Niedermeyer is here with us tonight to uh, share the uh, results of the audit, and he's joined at the table by our, our finance director, Tiffany Hooten. Turn it over to Tiffany and or uh, Paul. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Council. We do have Paul Niedermuller here from Clifton Larson Allen. And I just wanted to kind of say a few things before I uh, hand it over to Paul to kind of give you a review of their financial statements from 2022. I did want to remind council that we are limited to the number of years that we are able to contract with an auditor. And so this will be our last year with Clif Clifton Larson Allen. And so we will be posting an RFP uh, for the next five years for audit services, um, hopefully by the end of August, um, so that we can get that process going. But I also did just want to thank everyone, thank council, thank city staff, thank the finance department, and specifically Heather Byron, who is our controller. And all the work that goes into the preparation of the financial statements, the preparation for the audit, and providing all the information that our auditors request of us during the audit process. Uh, we typically start in January, and this year we ended in July. And um, on top of this year, uh, along going with the audit uh, preparation, we were also amidst our ERP implementation, which is continuing. And so it did take a lot of staff time and uh, a lot of effort going into our audit this year. And so I just wanted to thank Heather and others of the finance department um, for all their work on um, getting us where we are today. Uh, we do have a deadline with the state of July 31st to ensure that we file our audit with the state. And uh, we did meet that deadline this year. And um, I think with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Paul. Well, thank you. And good evening, honorable members of the city council and members of the public. And I think the great introduction, that we work for council, we work for members of the public. Uh, we are engaged by you. So this is the culmination of all the work that has been compiled since January to July. And we're here really to discuss you know, any interactions that we had with, with your team, uh, any results that you think is, is important to uh, your relevance as governance. And we are have, today we put together a 160 page document between us and the city of Littleton. Our intention is not to go over the financial information, but just talk about the process. <laughs> I will address the question that was posed uh, in the, the, the public comment. Gatsby Statement 98 uh, changed the term. CAFR is a derogatory term uh, used in, in South Africa and is a profoundly offensive term. And so that acronym has been uh, changed to ACFR. And so the utilization of that terminology going forward, or ACFR, is the proper pronunciation of the annual comprehensive financial report. Once that was brought to the attention of the Government and the Stand County Standards Board, that was changed immediately. And I know a lot of us are having trouble after doing these for so many years. But I just want to uh, remind everyone that is, a, that is an offensive term and should now be called going forward as the ACFR. Um, in terms of the financial statements themselves and kind of our role, I wanted to highlight on page 10 uh, of the first document, which is the ACFR. Um, we issued an unmodified opinion. And for uh, what that means is in all material respects, we stand behind the numbers presented uh, within this financial statement document. That is a clean opinion. And, and again, the most results you can receive from an audited financial statement. So I want to congratulate uh, you as governance as well as city uh, management for the clean opinion uh, as a result of performing our work for the year ended December 31, 2022. This year, uh, you're required to undergo a more comprehensive audit because of your recipients of federal dollars. And the trigger for that is $750,000. 
and the city uh, expended during the current calendar year, the 2022 calendar year, $2.8 million. So it was about four times over that amount, and that required us to look at two separate programs to make sure you were complying with the federal government's compliance uh, as a recipient of those dollars. So that report is in the back of your annual comprehensive financial report. And again, same result is a clean opinion in all material respects. We did have three comments uh, that we highlighted within the report itself. Uh, most of, all of those dealt with, dealt with procurement and some of the uniqueness with federal funds. We did not have any uh, monies that returned back or any material weaknesses, but just things for best practice standpoint. And management has prepared a corrective action plan, and that is w within your uh, financial statements. As a role of uh, the uh, subsequent auditors, they will be required to go in to make sure you've evaluated and changed and modified your internal controls, and that finding does not repeat in subsequent periods. So that will be have a look back uh, as you go forward in the 2023 audit. Uh, finally, we had a report called the governance, and uh, caption really is a uh, cliff note version of what happened. If I gave you the back and forth of the last six months and all the different dialogue, uh, we would be here for much later than the, the 15 minutes we had presented. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight, we did have a change in accounting standards. Uh, this is a profound change that dealt with leases. Uh, leases that were, where you have the right to use an asset. Uh, there was all, in the past there was just the ones that you acquired as capital. Leases, those were the only ones that were reported on the balance sheet. Uh, the city had to undergo a review of any leases that they have with outside parties that are payment to, to, for the right to use a specific asset. Uh, so those were evaluated and modified and conformed with these uh, current presentation. And in our governance communication, we said there were leases. It did not require a restatement or anything to that effect, but that is a change in how your accounting standards uh, are performed in accordance with between 21 and 2022. We did have a few uh, audit adjustments within your packet, uh, nothing of significance, as I already mentioned. Uh, we did not have any financial statement reporting conditions, which is, a, again, a very positive, so no findings and recommendations on the financial statements themselves. And then finally, I want to conclude uh, on the comments that Tiffany brought up. Uh, management was extremely helpful. Uh, we want to make sure that you understand the role and the responsibility of them to provide the information so we can do our job and come to the council tonight. And they, can, they, did, not, they did everything that we asked for, and we did not have any disagreements. We did not have any uh, areas where we, we were not unable to substantiate the numbers as presented. Uh, so I wanted to highlight that important topic of we did not have any issues surrounding uh, dealing with management as a result of performing uh, the audit for the year December 31, 2022. At this point, I'll take a breath and address any specific questions you have uh, as your external auditor. Council, any questions? Yes. Councilman Valdez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a couple questions. I left my notes at home, so I was trying to scroll through to see where I had made some marks, but I don't have many. It was on page 16, 16, let me get, let me get to that myself, uh, let's see, page 16, where are you, and that's finance, that's the uh, page number of the audit, where is it, there, 14, there we go, okay, and that's the, the net position. We're looking at when I look over to the far right when it's combined, uh, I, and, and where there's a 12 percent, almost 13 percent different on total liability that has changed, as well as on total net position of almost 11, oh, 10 and a half percent basically. What what is that reading? What is that telling me? So an increase in net position means that our restricted and our unrestricted and our investment in capital assets has increased as it relates to the prior year. So that's total liability as well? It is net of liabilities, so that would be our assets minus our liabilities plus uh, net position. Just a couple, only a couple more questions. So then I go to page 18. You know, a couple pages later. Uh, 
Uh, let's see, what was my question? I wish I had my, I, I just noticed that on our business activities, where they're a bit lower on our revenues and expenses are a bit higher, there's, is, there's no trend there. I, I didn't compare it to other years. I don't know that I have an exact answer for you now, uh, Council Member Valdez, but I would be happy to follow up with you on any of these specific questions. Um, just a reminder, business assets are related to our sewer and storm drainage and our Geneva Village Fund. So it is possible that our expenditures were higher in 2022 um, uh, compared to our revenues. We did forego or, or uh, hold some of our projects from 2020 and 2021. So it is very likely that those were completed in 2022. Great. My last question, and overall, I think this is really good. I thank you again for the five years that you have contracted with us. And, and it's always good to see our finance director come out uh, so well. Tiffany's been around a while. And she, uh, she got here just after we didn't have such a great audit. And then when uh, she was, were you the assistant when Doug was here? Yes. Yeah. So between uh, uh, the former director and Tiff's guidance, they, they pulled it all together. And we've had some excellent financials ever since then. I'm, I'm going to forego my last question. But I can always talk to Tiffany about it. But uh, again, thank you. And congratulations to Tiffany and your, your entire staff. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, yeah. Any other questions, Council? Yeah, I just want to echo the statements that this is, you know, always a good news to hear with this audit. You know, we don't want to hear a lot of issues with it. Uh, I do have one question for Paul, that given this is your, your fifth year going through the audits. Can you speak to kind of like the, the, the long-term picture, the broad picture of over five years, um, how you, you've seen the city improve processes or, or, or not? How, how has that been uh, visible to you and your team, uh, how they've been doing things? So I, I will do my best to, to, to take your question. I, I think you, over the last five years, three or four of them were COVID impacted. And so it was a significant pivot by governments to figure out how to manage uh, an entity this size in a remote environment. And so the, the flexibility and some of the other components that was pretty astounding. Uh, the, the city of Littleton did not skip a beat and I give the city the credit. Now, on a, uh, on a negative note, I think the governmental community is stressed with the ability of, of the finance professionals. Uh, I think there's been open positions uh, that have been uh, still in lay. I think the three findings relate to procurement. I know that's something that the, the city is, is working on hiring. So there has been a stress within finding capable and talented enough professionals to go into this space and to continue to carry out and so that's probably the biggest challenge as you go forth is, is the ability to retain and attract uh, talent for your financial statement um, positions. Um, which kind of leads me to one other question here that I'd probably for both uh, Tiffany and Paul is with that uh, charter requirement of um, changing uh, audits, auditors every five years, how, how difficult is that for you as an auditor and for the city when you have that relationship that has to basically end and start? And how long does it take to get to know the organization well enough as you do now? It, it's, a, it's a process for any firm coming in new to understand, especially this complex of an organization with the various funding streams, et cetera. And so there will definitely be a ramp up period and it'll take more than just a few phone calls and a few meetings. Uh, the internal controls and, and all the understanding of how they work, not just in written form. Uh, so it is a challenge. Uh, I know a lot of public companies have uh, partner rotations, so the firm doesn't necessarily change, and that's every seven years, and there's other, uh, other processes out there. Again, a good practice is to get fresh, sort of fresh perspective, but you can do that uh, in a lot of different ways, and it doesn't have to do from a complete rotation of firms. Yes, I'd like to add from a, a financial staff perspective, it is very difficult the first couple of years with a new auditor um, just because you're trying to help them understand your finances, you're trying to provide them with what I call permanent files, um, a lot of contracts, a lot of um, documents that we have to prepare and provide to a new auditor. And uh, so I would say the first couple of years it is very difficult from our perspective because we're acclimating them to our processes, to our internal controls. Um, having them understand uh, why we do things the way we do and 
um, some support behind that. Um, so I do think it takes probably at least a good two to three years for our current audit firm to really get familiar with our processes and our financial information. Is the way Littleton operates when that mandate to change every five years, is that common or is that unique? What, what do other municipalities typically do? From my perspective, I feel like it is uncommon. It is housed in our city charter that we're required to have a five-year rotation. Um, I think it probably varies depending on the organization. I've seen other cities that might have a 20-year auditor, um, but I have seen others that might rotate every five, seven years. But I would say five to seven years is probably on the lower side. Um, you know, there's a, it's important to find a good auditor that you have a good working relationship with, too. And, and having to build that and continue that in, in, in five years and having it uh, start again is also part of it. Okay. Mayor, to that, if I may add, just sure. common practice I've seen, a more common practice is to, for policy to require a change perhaps in the, the lead auditor, but not, not necessarily completely change firms every, every five years, or, or allowing the existing firm to compete for the contract again, uh, but the requirement to definitely change firms um, is, is less common. Okay, I mean, I don't know if... Uh, that might be something at some future time to talk about, looking at that, maybe going on. I don't know. I mean, this comes up once every every year, and it's kind of glossed over, and, you know, we might have a robust discussion if we want to put it on the ballot to change that or at least have a discussion on the pros and cons of the way we do it sometime in, you know, sometime in the future. No, no rush on that, but I don't know if other council would like to at least have that discussion and kind of understand it, especially as we go through this process uh, of selecting a new daughter right now to kind of help council... Um, and the, the new council that comes in uh, uh, in a couple months understand that process and how why, how we might improve efficiencies um, that benefit council and the, the city as a whole. So, thank you, Councilmember Grove. Um, I see your point in trying to get up to speed every time, but it also is probably good to have a fresh set of eyes too, to make sure that there's no anomalies that people kind of. Uh, gloss over every year or uh, to get a fresh explanation, even though it may take, I, I can see your point, it may just take longer, but maybe it's just a little bit more protection. Yeah, not to age myself, but I believe I'm on, we're on our fourth or fifth auditors since I've been here with the city, so. Councilmember Valdez? And we do have that conversation every five years. And, and it, it is for just what Council Member Grove just said, is just the fresh set of eyes to make sure we're not missing something or that there's no fraud. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, next up uh, we have Resolution 91, uh, which is a resolution uh, approving an intergovernmental agreement regarding the Tri-Cities Navigation Center. Uh, we do have a uh, presentation on this, and so I'll ask uh, Mike Elizabeth to come on up and turn it over to the city manager to introduce this for council. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the city, the city uh, continues to be part of the, uh, the Tri Cities Homelessness Almost As Policy uh, Committee, and one of the, uh, I'd say, hallmark and chief actions in this, the first uh, two-year action plan is the establishment of a housing. <coughs> Navigation Center. Uh, this would be a, a place where unhoused individuals can come uh, to be connected first and foremost with uh, social services and I ideally ho housing services, but also to uh, receive respite and be able to receive mail, which is a main challenge for many um, trying to you know, seek jobs, some very you know, basic things that, that, can, that can be located at this housing navigation center that can really give some give folks some anchor in, in the community and find some help that they, they need. So there are a number of uh, services that will be part of this uh, contract that we'll have with uh, Bridge House, who is the uh, selected but not yet contracted vendor for the uh, housing navigation service. Tonight, though, we have kind of the fundamental document so that's important to folks managing the kind of finances of it. We have an IGA among the Tri-Cities to make sure that we're very clear about how uh, payment and management of the contract for the Navigation Center will happen. Uh, the city of Littleton, we're kind of, the cities are taking turns in some of the major major responsibilities of the action plan and, uh, and Littleton volunteered 
to uh, take the point on, the, on contracting for the Housing Navigation Center. Um, so it's important that we have this IGA in place so that all the cities are clear on the funding and administration of that, that contract. So um, if council uh, passes this tonight, we'll be ready to move into the contracting phase with the provider and uh, move into uh, Bridge House or move along with Bridge House. And with that, I'm going to turn it over. I want to introduce council to, to Elizabeth Watts. Anyone who's been in the city manager's office has seen Elizabeth. She's been with us for, I'm guessing, six months-ish. And uh, she is our management fellow and has really uh, dug in and worked on, done kind of the basic uh, research and work on many of our projects right now. And you'll be seeing more of Elizabeth in the, in the coming months as some of her work comes to, to fruition. So I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce Elizabeth. And she's joined at the staff table by Mike Sangren, who is the Tri-Cities Homelessness Services Coordinator employed by, uh, by the county. So with that, we have a short presentation. Take it away, Elizabeth. Um, I, think, I think your mic's off. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. Anyways. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Um, as uh, the City Manager said, my name is Elizabeth Watts. Um, I am very thankfully joined with Mike Sandgren, um, our Tri-Cities uh, Homeless Services Coordinator. Try not to make the same mistake. Am I on? Yeah. Here we go. Uh, good evening, Council. Thanks for <laughs> allowing me to be here. They didn't hear you say that before, so. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Um, yeah, we're excited to, to be here to present, uh, provide an update on the status of this particular project. This, obviously, as Elizabeth will touch on, fits within the broader Tri-Cities Action Plan that's been adopted by the, the three cities of Inglewood, Littleton, and Sheridan. Um, this falls within the single adult system that we're building to serve, as um, City Manager Becklenberg alluded to, the, the needs of um, our unhoused community members, single adults experiencing homelessness. Um, we're excited to um, be at this place, provide this update, and outline next steps this evening. Um, and I want to—I I would be remiss not to just say a word of thanks to the city of Littleton for um, taking point on the administration of this RFP process. Um, it was no small feat, and um, you guys championing this project really helped move it along in an efficient way. So, thank you so much. Um, I just want to start uh, quickly by saying that this effort would not be possible without the support of City Council, continued support. I know that we come back and we talk about the action plan. Um, it's been a couple years now, so um, this wouldn't be possible without you. So very excited to be pushing this forward, um, especially uh, we'll be seeing these. Mike will be have, attending quite a few City Council sessions um, this month uh, with the cities of Inglewood and Sheridan to move this along with their City Councils as well. Um, so we're gonna, I'll just provide a very quick overview, um, which you probably have already heard of the uh, action plan as, as it relates to the Navigation Center. We could talk very briefly about the RFP process that we underwent, um, and then I'll talk to you about what the Navigation, or the IGA is actually going to um, formalize for us. And then uh, Mike and I can answer any questions that you might have. Um, so like Mike said, this uh, the core tenant of the action plan that we are uh, targeting with the Navigation Center is to provide streamlined services um, in one location um, for single adults experiencing homelessness. Um, this, the two things we needed to do for this item are to designate a lead service provider um, and then actually create the Navigation Center. So in order to do that, we had to undergo a procurement uh, or yeah, a procurement process, we went through an RFP. Um, this was in partnership with all of the cities, um, some local service providers, as well as um, an individual with uh, um, lived experience. But Littleton did lead this effort, um, but it would not have been possible without the rest of our, our team members. Um, the, the evaluation committee made a unanimous decision to select Bridge House, and they will be offering navigation center services at their physical Inglewood location, in addition to the ready to work services that they're already offering. The IGA is essentially going to um, govern the shared responsibilities that the, tri the Tri-Cities are already engaging in through the um, action plan. So uh, per the action plan, the city of Littleton will be uh, providing $78,750 towards this action, uh, towards the navigation center. The total between all three cities is $175,000, um, broken up between the lead service provider as well as the actual navigation center startup. 
that was very brief, high level. If there are any questions, both of us are happy to answer. Council, any questions? Customer Grove. When's this gonna open? We are working with Bridge House to plan out the, the process right now um, within their proposal they projected a Q1 of 2024 launch. Um, but obviously in conversation with Bridge House as we work through the, the details of the contract, um, we will be asking them to move expeditiously and, and explore capacity around launching um, even prior to the renovation of their facility, um, possibly doing satellite uh, services oh. and things like that so we can move uh, move the launch as efficiently as possible. So we don't have to wait till Bridge House is done before uh, we? Possibly, that's that's one of, the, one of the asks we'll be making in the contracting process is to um, not make the launch uh, fully contingent on the renovation of that facility. Do you envision a rollout of services like um, maybe not offering everything all at once, but slowly rolling them in until? Right, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Mayor, I'd like to just also mention along the theme of services, um, one thing that's exciting about this, about partnering with, with Bridge House as opposed to potentially some others, is that they also plan to offer 25 uh, beds for, for sheltering there. Um, it's not a, a service that we've had. It's not a service that we required in the uh, in the RFP, and it's frankly not a service that I see very often in uh, in navigation uh, centers. But but that's that's going to be a very important. It's not an extensive, you know, 25 beds is very limited given the need, but it is a start, and um, we're very pleased to be able to to have that that service as, as part of the navigation center. Yeah, that component certainly strengthened their response to the RFP. And, and I will note, just to head off any other questions about the beds, those beds will be in addition to the 48 workforce program beds in that facility. So that'll be, that won't be a subtraction from the workforce beds. That'll be in addition to. Great. Councilman Grove? Just a follow-up question. So those 25 beds are more temporary than the people? Correct. Right. Ah, OK. Right. So that, because mm -hmm. I went to a graduation from Bridge House in Aurora and Boulder. And it was quite inspiring, especially to hearing the stories. And so that's, mm -hmm. it, it's great. Maybe some of the people that um, come for temporary shelter may want to apply to enter the program. Absolutely. I think that that's one of the reasons that, that the services that they're already offering, it's a, it's a wonderful pairing. Um, so the Navigation Center, in addition to Ready to Work, is, was really just, I think, an unimaginable <laughs> um, outcome. So yeah, it's a great program. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, just thank you for highlighting that, um, City Manager Becklenberg. That is a huge deal for our community because that's just a huge gap that we don't have for emergency beds um, for folks. So I really am excited to hear what that entails and what their plan is for that. And then just a reminder that we're, we're trying to be um, intentional about using Ready to Work as the company name just because we have another institution here in Littleton that is Bridge House that's um, part of a crisis stabilization acute treatment center and so that's known in the community as well so we don't want to conflate the two so just like our, our naming you know matters so we don't confuse of, of what's happening. And, and that's helpful. I, I'll, I'll just add to that the, you know, in, in where we recognize in the same facility, you know, we will have the ready to work program, um, those 48 workforce beds, and then we will be adding the navigation center in the same facility managed by um, the, the same organization. And so, you know, we'll be, we'll be working with them to find the right branding for the navigation program to help make that delineation from a communication standpoint. For example, when they ran a navigation uh, program up in Boulder for several years, it was called Path to Home. We could vision finding kind of a, a unique brand for the navigation program um, to help make that delineation as well so we're not reliant to your point on, on the nomenclature of bridge house yeah go ahead um, and I just want to add to that this is what we planned for right we planned it it was in the action plan that we all discussed um, and now we're following through on it so yes this takes a while but it's kind of cool to see a planning thing happen and then the implementation happening as well and speaking of that implementation plan, I mean, we're already in year two and we're not well ahead of schedule. Maybe you could speak to the percentage. I don't have it off the top of my head, but when we look at our milestones, we're tracking very well with what was planned. And I think that's great. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Said yes. Oh. Council Member Values. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mike, congratulations. I know we've talked about this for quite a while and uh, it's not easy getting there. And it's not going to be easy job for anybody that does it, but it's but we're, it is going to help some folks out. So uh, 
uh, thanks for hanging in there and getting it done. Thanks. Absolutely. I would, sorry, I would be remiss as well. Mike is uh, phenomenal. Oh, so much of this work. Um, also, our amazing prior assistant uh, city manager, Sam Fox, uh, was really foundational in leading this effort for Littleton, especially our procurement effort. So um, Mike is phenomenal, and I don't want to take away any, <laughs> any um, amazing uh, work that Mike has done, but I also I feel like Sam uh, needs some, a little bit of a, a shout out. Councilman Milliman. I just want to, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you so much for all the hard work that you're doing on this and uh, the collaboration between the three cities, all of the different nonprofit agencies, everybody that's involved in this. I know it's going to be hugely successful and I cannot wait to see it expanded. Thank you. And I just want to add that uh, some of the other municipalities, especially in Jefferson County and some of the other ones in Arapahoe County are uh, speak highly of this, you know, seeing how what what our three cities are doing, working together, and so, uh, how have you have, have any of them reached out to either of you to kind of explore how they're how they can maybe uh, uh, build off of what you're what you've done? Because I know this is kind of a, a a gem in 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 the southwest part of the metro area. Yeah, I, I can speak to that. I would say, you know, I, I just hit a year in the job about a month ago, and um, in that year, on at least four or five occasions, I've found myself in meetings with municipalities, regions throughout the metro region, as well as statewide, kind of asking, you know, what does the Tri-Cities work look like? You know, how, what, in, what kind of streamlines of communication have you built, and kind of how, how have you built this regional collaboration? Because um, it's, it is rare, and even, even being in meetings with you know, at, at the regional level, um, it's there, I'm constantly reminded how helpful it is to have a monthly touch point with um, the, the regional scope and even, you know, coordination amongst the service providers at the ground level. And so it is, it is rare what we have. And, and you know, I think that the job in the next couple of years is to steward it to make some impact. Yeah, it's unfortunate that it's rare, the collaboration and coordination there, because too often, you know, that's one of the reasons we decided for doing this is, you know, no, our cities can't do this alone. And so having, having them work together. And so I think some of the other municipalities are looking towards that to see how they can work together rather than try to carry things alone. So uh, thank you both for all the work that you've done for that. Um, and so I think this is a great program. Um, ready is I'm ready for a motion. Can I make one? You may make one. Right. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. I move to approve resolution 91-2023, approving the IGA with the cities of Inglewood and Sheridan for an aggravation Nag center as part of the implementation of the Tri-City Homeless Action Plan. Second that. We have a motion and a second from Mayor Pro Tem Royden. Uh, Council, any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, I will open... Uh, the voting. The vote is five in favor. The motion carries. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you. Uh, well job, uh, job well done in your first presentation to council there. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see, where am I? Uh, C. Uh, item C, ID 23191, is a motion to approve an amendment to the city manager's employment agreement. Uh, we do have HR Director Tracy Hooker to come here to answer any questions, but I just want to, do you want to do a talk about it, or do you want me to say kind of the whole process of what city, what we did? And Okay, well, so just for the public, uh, you know, city council uh, every year reviews the uh, um, uh, performance of both the city manager and city attorney. I'm going to talk kind of both of both together at this one point right now, and we can do the separate motions uh, for the contracts as we get to it. Um, but council uh, coordinated with a consultant, a facilitator, to help us um, work through our evaluation of both the manager and city attorney. Um, we set goals of how we were going to go through that process. Uh, we provided individual feedback from council's perspective, but also had uh, uh, feedback from staff on their performance. Uh, we had three executive sessions, uh, one on May 16th, one on June 20th, and one on July 18th, uh, where we discussed the evaluation, pro provided feedback to both, uh, and discussed their compensation. And so tonight we have before us an uh, amendment to their employment contracts. And if council has any questions for uh, Ms. Hooker, we can have that, or we can go straight through with the motion. Uh, Mayor, I move to approve the proposed amendment to the city manager's employment agreement. 
Councilman Emma needs to mute her microphone so you can. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion, Council? Nope. All right, um, I'll just want to add both of them. I think for uh, we're glad we have Gemma on board here. Uh, it's been just over a year, and so doing a good job, and uh, we hope you stick around and keep doing a good job. Uh, Councilman Valdez. Yeah, I, it, it appears as though we're rushing this, but we're not. We have talked about this for quite a while, so uh, it, uh, I don't want to give the impression to the public that, hey, this came up tonight and, hey, we're just approving this. We, as you had mentioned, we have talked about this going back months, going back months, uh, looking at comparisons and stuff. I do think going forward, we, we do want to look at how we are comparing and do we, in looking at this 51%, you know, above the mean, mediums out there for certain positions. That's something we want to look at. I think you've mentioned Metro mayors might even be, had mentioned something along that line. But uh, I, I, I think this is something that city council has looked at uh, for months. And so it's not just something we just got last week and we decided to do it. So, and I can't believe for the city manager, it's a year. When I looked at your start date, I was like, what? It was just fun, I guess. Yeah, thanks. That you're going to say only 10 months. Along those lines, uh, Councilmember Valdez, um, I know I've talked to city manager and talked to HR department about trying to have a, a handbook as a guide for future councils. So it's it's a little more transparent of how this process works, so we can look to see what the steps are, uh, what the criteria for evaluation are, and and how we go about doing that. So I think we're moving that direction. So that, I think that will be a good a good step in the right direction there. All right. Any other comments? See them. We have a motion and a second. Vote should be open. The vote is five in favor. The motion carries. Same thing with the city attorney that I said we you know met executive sessions. We did those both kind of concurrently there. So I'm not going to uh, uh, opine on any further uh, um, issues with that process, um, or how we did that process. So is there a motion? Mayor, move to approve the proposed amendment to the city attorney's employment agreement. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion, Council? Council Member I just want to say thank you, Tracy, so much for your guidance through all this, um, this past, these past couple of months with that. Really appreciate you. You're and the consultant too as well, or whoever that lady was. Yes, thank Sarah. you. Thank you. I'll say Sarah Roberts, yeah. Sarah Roberts, yeah, thank you. She did a good job of, of kind of corralling all of council here to get our comments and, and talk through uh, our evaluation and help us talk through with staff evaluation as well. Um, so it was great, a good process this year, I think, so. All right, we have a motion and a second uh, to approve the amendment to the contract. Voting is open. Mayor Pro Tem. The vote is five in favor. The motion carries. Great. All right. Next up, we'll move on to ordinances on second reading and public hearing. We have, looks like, three tonight. Uh, first is ordinance 12, 2023, an ordinance on second reading, amending multiple sections of the Littleton Municipal Code, Title VI, pertaining to police regulations. The city attorney is moving seats to go to his presentation over there. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to the city attorney to present. What do I do? Thank I you, Mayor. Turn it over to the city attorney. So. I need I need special assistance to S sidebar to navigate anything technologically related. Um, thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, tonight before you, as mentioned, are just uh, about four specific updates to our criminal code. Three of them necessitated in part by changes at state law. Um, and they should be pretty, pretty quick to go through. So obviously, Council is being asked to consider um, repealing a couple of our ordinances and then making a couple of changes to two others that we have. Um, that first ordinance uh, that council action is being requested is our animal cruelty ordinance. And what that uh, is a result of is at the state level in House Bill 23-1286, 
Um, they had modified kind of the mandatory penalties associated with animal cruelty. So in order for us to be, I guess, in comport with state law, what we wanted to do is promulgate kind of those same rules within our own ordinance so that we wouldn't be sentencing someone to something less than what was happening at the state level. Um, the second change tonight is necessitated, both changes two and three um, are necessitated by a change at state ordinance. So Senate Bill 23097, remove the valuation of vehicles as a charging factor. Uh, previously, uh, in order to file something within a municipal court or have it at a misdemeanor level, the value of a vehicle had to be $2,000 or less, <coughs> which is pretty difficult to do in today's market. Obviously, auto vehicle thefts, motor vehicle thefts have been in the news um, due to the increase in crime related to those. So what ended up happening on a state level is that the state basically uh, declared that to be a felony. And so there's three different levels of felonies that motor vehicle theft fall into. As our municipal court cannot prosecute felonies, uh, it is necessitated that we remove that and repeal that from our ordinance or our, our city codes. Um, related to that same bill is motor, motor vehicle trespass. That's you not actually stealing the vehicle, that's you riding in a vehicle that's stolen. Um, second offenses for this can trigger felony filings, and so it's important, um, I think, to be consistent with state law that we remove that as being able to be charged within our municipal court um, so that they can track that better at a state level. Um, the state uses CCIC for all their bookings. A lot of our bookings don't necessarily end up on there unless it, there is an arrest. So there is the potential that someone could be charged with motor vehicle trespass, um, and then that can occur in the future at a state level, and they would never be aware that that had actually occurred. So that is being asked to be repealed. And the last one is just kind of a cleanup of an original ordinance that we adopted a few years ago, um, and that is adding a um, text messaging to also be something included for the misuse of 911. So Obviously, technology has changed over the years. Some of the concerns that we had here in Littleton once upon a time, and I know other jurisdictions have had, has been the misuse of 911. Um, you know, as Mayor Pro Tem noticed, they're very busy over in our police dispatch center, and to have an individual harassing or constantly calling without having an emergency could potentially cost lives. And so we're asking that that ordinance be amended to include texting 911 as also a possible uh, municipal offense. And those are the four changes in our criminal code. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Does council have any questions? Uh, council, or Mayor Pro Tem? What would be uh, criteria for the criminal of like texting 911 like what would be like are there exceptions to that if we were to pass that ordinance technically generally it's it is texting for no reason or texting when you're not having an emergency it's one thing if you if you call and they direct you somewhere else but if you can if you start harassing um, through that process then that would be a violation Are there wait times that that would be waived if there were mental health challenges with the individual? Yeah, I mean the discretion of of the charging is always up to our police officers. They generally have a pretty good grasp on a uh, person that they're dealing with, as well as do our police dispatchers. Is this someone who is intentionally trying to do it, or simply just does not understand that this is not the um, medium that you should be communicating with 911. Okay. Any other questions? All right, as this is a, uh, oh, thank you for that presentation. Yeah, I mean, just to clarify a little bit further in regard to the 911, I mean, it's basically when you're calling and you're providing false information, um, when you're calling as like a prank, um, when you're requesting emergency assistance, when there's not an emergency, I mean, those are basically the elements of that offense. Um, and so calling or texting 911 when there's no emergency is generally what that boils down to. 
and purposefully, you know, Purpose, uh, you know, yeah. a child dies. There has to be kind of the mens rea. Obviously, not going to be charged sure. or someone that you know. It, it's the the continue the harassment. You know, I don't think one text or one call is going to mm -hmm. precipitate that. All right, as this is a uh, ordinance on second reading, a public hearing, I will open in the hearing at, or the public comment portion at eight o'clock. Uh, there's no one signed up to speak. Anybody in the audience wish to speak? Seeing no one, I will close the public comment at 8 o'clock. Um, <coughs> is there a motion? Mayor, I move to approve Ordinance 12-2023 on second reading, amending multiple sections of Littleton mm. Municipal Code, Title VI, pertaining to police regulations. There's a second from Councilmember Valdez. Um, so we have a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 12. Council, any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, I am going to open voting. I, I did learn that the texting feature is not used that often. I didn't, even, I didn't even know you could text 911. Yeah, and I meant to include that actually in my comments that folks can use 911 as a special little thing that the dispatchers have so they can respond to that. Um, yeah, it's kind of cool. Council room. oh, there we go. The vote is five in favor. The motion carries. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, next item on the agenda is Ordinance 11 of 2023, an ordinance on second reading amending Ordinance 23, Series 2022, known as the Annual Appropriation Bill for all municipal purposes of the City of Littleton, Counties of Arapaho, Douglas, and Jefferson, State of Colorado, for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2023 and December 31st, 2023. We'll have a presentation by staff. Um, turn over to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Just to, to be clear, this uh, presentation will cover the, the next two agenda items. They're both budget related, just for different funds. Uh, so uh, my, my uh, intro is very short. Uh, this budget um, amendment will uh, cover things, just several very specific things that were unforeseen when the, uh, when the budget was, was adopted. So I will uh, turn this over to Tiffany Hooten and Keith Reister for an explanation. Good evening, Council. Uh, before you, you have two ordinances. We did combine this into one presentation. Um, they are both related to budget amendments and for very specific reasons. And uh, we have two. We do have to appropriate from three different funds. Uh, so one is to appropriate uh, funds related to the Denver Broncos monies that were received in 2022 and the uh, second one is to appropriate funds for the culvert collapse on Jackass Hill and then we also have a donation from Telluray that we are asking for a budget amendment for as well. We've talked about stadium district funding. We did have a uh, study session with council uh, related to LPS and some other potential needs. Um, we do need to appropriate this out of our consolidated special revenue fund in order for us to spend any money related to the stadium district funds. Um, we did receive this in 2022, so it is already part of our fund balance, if you will, that's carried into 2023. And so we will be using fund balance for this appropriation. We do have a uh, process that we are uh, going through currently to solicit applications from local organizations um, so that we can bring, back, bring that back to council so that we can discuss what we might use those funds for um, in 2023. The main key is that these funds would, will need to benefit youth activity programs. The second one is related to the rocket booster, and we did have a study session on July 18th with a couple of members from DISH and Telluray um, who spoke at length about this project and what we will be doing. And there is no fund balance impact to this because it is a donation or grant from the Telluray Foundation of $2.4 million. Um, so no impact to our funds. Um, we will receive the money and we will spend that money on the uh, construction of the um, housing for that rocket booster. Um, we have a lot of information related to the rocket booster, um, and I have Keith here who can 
answer any questions if you have any specifics, but uh, you know this will be housed over near DISH network and it, there will be access from the river um, <coughs> and there will be an area for visitors to observe uh, the rocket booster once it is in place. And uh, we do feel like there is gonna be a financial benefit potentially to the city, um, just bringing some people here um, who might wanna look at Littleton and, and visit the rocket booster. The total of these two appropriations is 3.629201. 2.4 will be in the general fund. Again, this is uh, revenue coming in and expenditures going out for the same amount, so no impact to our fund balance. And then the uh, Denver Broncos Stadium District funds will be out of the consolidated special revenue. Again, we received 1.229201 in 2022, and we will be spending that exact amount related to this funding source. The last budget amendment we are requesting is related to the culvert collapse on uh, Jackass Hill. And uh, we are required to replace this, and we are currently doing, and Keith, when is the road going to be open? Next week. I'm not going <laughs> to overstate it, but I feel more confident than that. <laughs> Perfect. That's great news, right? Um, with that great news comes a cost, of course, and uh, so we are requesting uh, $1.2 million out of the storm drainage fund. We are looking internally. Uh, we may require a loan from either the general fund or the storm drainage fund related to this and some other culvert collapses that we are dealing with currently. And so the intention is that we may bring an action to council in the next uh, month or two related to some sort of loan agreement. Um, we're also working with Arapahoe County on um, some state and federal funding uh, for an emergency declaration that has been approved. Um, we aren't guaranteed anything yet, but uh, we do anticipate hopefully um, some funding uh, reimbursement related to that as well. The total for this is 1.2 million, and this would be out of the stormwater and flood management utility enterprise. Um, you have a couple of alternatives, but uh, um, approve the amendments is the preferred one. Um, otherwise, we will have to look to an alternative. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions? Happy to answer any. Council, any questions? Councilmember Grove. Uh, can you explain how the loan works and how we repay it, especially well, if we don't? I get think that would be a different topic. That's not that. That's not tonight's agenda. She said maybe in a month or two we would talk Correct. about that. So that's not on tonight's agenda. Correct. Yes, this evening is just to appropriate the 1.2 <coughs> related to the Jackass Hill culvert collapse. I'll just add, uh, Councilmember, part of the reason we're, I know our public work staff is still doing the research on the uh, scale and scope of the, uh, the culvert collapses that we're seeing, and we're also doing the research with several different potential loan agencies, their government funding sources that do this kind of loan all the time, but we're really not ready tonight to uh, talk about how that, that loan could work. Councilman Valdez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, on the uh, Bronco funds, we had mentioned that, or that I know uh, Councilmember Driscoll had mentioned during our study session, and I, I agreed with him. Um, how are we getting word out there that that money is available to uh, some of these folks to uh, use it the right way? Yes, uh, it gives, gives me uh, um, also opportunity to Re recap the use of the total amount. We do, we, we did have that, that, that study session and out of the study session came some, some interest from, from council and uh, some, some questions, but also some, uh, some direction to, um, if it all worked, that we could move forward with $200,000 for the East Community Center, and that is our, our plan. The remainder, which will be a little more than a million dollars, um, has been bundled into our Community Partnerships grant program and has been been marketed as we we do those grants every year with special notice on this funding and that purpose i know that staff in our office also called uh, as many of the youth sports and arts and assistance organizations that we could think of we did some brainstorming and you know reached out personally to as many of them as we could so um, those applications will be coming back in with the rest of the, the community partnership grants you know we're, we're finding this that some some uh, potential applicants 
you know, qualify for more than one of the various categories, but um, the stadium grants is, is certainly a larger one. So um, that's how those have been marketed, and we're, we're eager to see how, they're, how they come back in. Any other questions? Miller. When do those funds need to be spent by? Is there a deadline or is there an end, end date? Or, no. There's no deadline. Okay, no. perfect. Anyone else? I just have one question, point of clarification for the finance director. Um, I think to leave it any confusion, we are not actually spending those funds for the stadium district fund. We are appropriating them so that we can move forward and spend them after we go through this process of identifying um, projects that fit that uh, um, mandate to spend a youth program, correct? Yes, correct. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, any other questions? Okay, as this is an ordinance on second reading, uh, I have a public comment portion. Uh, we have one person signed up. Uh, so, Pam Chadborn. Um, part of this, you know what I'm going to say. So, um, first, though, I love stormwater management. I live on a hill, and uh, it's very important to direct uh, excess water uh, well and into storm drains and handle it so that it's clean. Um, so. Uh, <coughs> It's for a culvert collapse, and that's also interesting. And a question I have, maybe for nerds, I guess, is what happened 80 years ago or 60 years ago when some contractor built these original culverts? Is there uh, some failure that happened back then that we could anticipate maybe a few more of these that were done by the same contractor or you know, had the same materials or something like that? If it's a terrible research project, then it's not worth it, but I'm kind of wondering if there's a way we can predict these. You know, Englewood has had these for a while, and uh, some of the flooding there resulted in deaths. So um, anyway, I'm just curious if there's any kind of pattern that's discernible that would help us predict these coming up. Um, the Broncos Fund, I love that you're considering giving part of it to East Community Center. Uh, thank you for that, and I hope that you do. Um, but third, I don't want $2.4 million to be used for a hollow <laughs> rocket tube that doesn't relate to Littleton's history in any way. Um, the Titan launch vehicle was actual engineering advancement. The different versions of the Titan that were released over decades um, taught us uh, in the United States a lot about how to build more reliable, um, better launch vehicles. SpaceX is a whole different thing, and they don't have a presence in Littleton. Uh, I don't, and again, I've mentioned before, um, during this time that this was going on with the city, public works apparently in economic development, um, the DDA, the bid DDA study sessions were going on behind the scenes as well. And somebody certainly knew about that and heard businesses say, we're worried about unhoused people. We think it's a security threat. Oh no, uh, these people are threatening to us who are unhoused. <laughs> um, why wasn't there a connection of, here's someone who wants to donate to the city and we have business people saying they want help with this. Why wasn't that connection made? Um, it, it, I think this is money could have been used in different ways and it wasn't publicly accessible. We had nothing to do, no say in this. I don't like the Telluride deal, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Chadbourne. Is there anybody else that wish to speak on this agenda item? Seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public comment at 8 to 8.13. Uh, and see if the city manager or public works director have any uh, yes. response. Yes, I will take, the, take an opportunity to give some credit to the public works department for the work they've done that you might hear about in recent years to really identify and start to predict some of these. And I, uh, we actually had this area planned for, re, for uh, replacement coming up. But I will stop there. I'll, I'll ask Mr. Reister to speak to the history on this, this area and what we know. 
Well, the good part, public works director, Keith Reister, I don't get called a nerd a lot, except <laughs> by my kids, so I appreciate that, Pam. Um, you know, from uh, the, the stormwater area, you know, what, what we have here is that this portion of the city was primarily built out in the mid-80s, late 70s, and at that point in time, a uh, common practice for um, stormwater piping was corrugated metal pipe. It was kind of the industry standard at that time. Um, since that time, it, because of situations like this, that has changed. In fact, uh, the state has a <clears throat> the state bridge division has a program where they inspect all the the bridges in the state um, over 20 foot spans, and they do that for local governments at no charge. Because CDOT had a whole series of these um, in the mountain corridor about 15 years ago that prompted that entire program. So as part of our asset management uh, development that we've done over the last four or five years, we actually know what's out there now. We know that, um, for example, the situation we have in Mineral, that there's a 1,000 feet of corrugated metal pipe out there. We also know that within this section of the city, like if you put a, a pin in the jackass culvert and drew a circle for a mile, probably a good portion of that is corrugated metal pipe. So you know, at 40 plus years, um, we're not surprised that we're gonna see that. So um, what we are in the process of doing, as we are already doing with our um, asset management, is we're taking a look at all of those areas with the camera work and some new acoustic sound work that we're doing, identifying the sections that have problems, and then those that are um, provide also the highest risk. You know, a, a culvert collapse in a cul-de-sac is very different than a culvert collapse on Jackass Hill Road, for example. So uh, how do we bring all that together and then mix together the techniques, whether it's replacing that with reinforced concrete or say a pipe is still structurally sound, but we can line the pipe um, to get another 30 years out of it. Those are the kind of things that we're working on. And as we've talked about um, at the staff level with the city manager's office and finances, you know, we're, we're gonna bring you um, here in the near future a report of what all that looks like out there um, on the stormwater side, what it would take for us to kind of bump up some accelerated work on those areas to get in front of this. Um, and, and really put some risk analysis to it so you can see what's out there. Great, thank you. Does Council have any other questions? No questions, but thank you so much for uh, expediting, our, but very safely and very carefully um, securing and repairing that culvert collapse. Um, I know when I left my house this morning to go pick up my mother-in-law in, -law in uh, Highlands Ranch, the I know it's back to school, today's first day back to school, but the amount of traffic on Prince was more than I've ever seen before. So I'm very much looking forward to that reopening, so thank you. Great, and there a motion, Council? Thank you, Mayor. I move to approve ordinance 11-2023 on second reading amended the ordinance 23 series 2022 known as the appropriations bill for all municipal municipal purposes of the city of Littleton County of counties of Arapaho, Douglas and Jefferson state of Colorado for a fiscal year beginning January 1, 2023 and ending December 31, 2023. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on Ordinance 11, Council? Uh, I'll just add that uh, I think these are uh, both benefits uh, to the community here, uh, both uh, to our youth and to the economy, and you know, does speak, uh, at least with the rocket, to the history of the importance of DISH and you know the connection that they've had with that. So I will be... Uh, supporting both these uh, options. So, Council, voting is open. The vote is five in favor. The motion carries. All right, uh, next up is Ordinance 13, 2023, an ordinance on second reading amending the 2023 Stormwater, Littleton Stormwater and Flood Management Utility Enterprise budget. Does Council have any questions related to that after the presentation? Um, I believe the commenter uh, spoken that, but I will see uh, open public comment to see if anyone has anything else to say about that. Seeing no one, I'm going to close it at 8:19 as well. Um, and is there a motion, Council? Mayor, I move to approve Ordinance 13-2023, Ordinance on Second Reading, amending the 20, 
23 Littleton Stormwater and Flood Management Utility Enterprise Budget. Second. A motion and a second from Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, let's see, Council, is there any um, further discussion? I'll just add to uh, Public Works Director, uh, echo Councilmember Milliman's comments, so thank you. Uh, you know, I know we've heard, Council has heard a lot from the public about this and why it was taking so long. And, uh, you know, I think uh, Mother Nature didn't cooperate all that much. And a lot of the material that's required, you just can't go out and buy it at Home Depot or Lowe's. So when it's not available, it's, uh, you're kind of on their clock. And I was did, talking to a neighbor who, uh, works in a large uh, engineering firm that does big projects like this, and he actually commended the city to say, wow, he, he thought that actually it was going fast for the amount of work that was going on there. So uh, just wanted to say the city's doing a good job and not delaying that, and, you know, it, it's, it's going ahead of schedule, so thank you so much. All right, uh, we have motion a second to approve ordinance 13. The vote's open. The vote is five in favor. The motion carries. Great. Thank you. Uh, next up on the agenda is uh, a motion to adjourn to executive session. Is there a motion? Mayor, I moved that we move to adjourn to an executive session. Can you can you read the exact I, wording, please? Nope, I cannot. I can read right. it. I have it in front of me. Do we have Mayor, a second? Mayor Pro Temis. Thank you. Yes. So. All right. I move to go into executive session pursuant to CRS 246-4024-D1 and Article 3, Section 27 of the City Charter for purpose of discussing matters required to be kept confidential by federal and state laws or rules or regulations, including but not limited to specialized details of security arrangements or investigations, including defenses against terrorism or criminal acts, both foreign and domestic. Is there a second? Yes. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second to go into executive session. Uh, any further discussion? Let me open the voting. The vote is five in favor. The motion carries. Okay, the City Council has voted five to zero in favor of going into executive session for the purpose of discussing matters required to be kept confidential by federal and state laws or rules or regulations, including but not limited to specialized details of security arrangements or investigations, including defenses against terrorism or criminal acts, both foreign or domestic. No formal action can occur in executive session. At the conclusion of the executive session, council will return to the regular meeting in the council chamber. This executive session will be conducted in the council chamber, and we ask your cooperation in clearing the room for the duration of the executive session. Uh, we'll come back in here and I do not expect any further action after that. So we are adjourned into executive session.
take a regular right. session? That's right. I just message her to let her know. Yeah, she's keeping it there. Do you have anybody? Okay. Uh, yeah, she's doing All right, great. Uh, no further business. We're going to adjourn at 9.25 p.m. Excellent. 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 Yeah. Yeah.